Good evening. Welcome to the lecture series. My name is Enrique Walker. I'm the director of the AD program um, and will um, host the session on behalf of Manuel Andraos tonight. Um, it is my pleasure to uh, welcome to the school Camilo Restrepo. Um, Camilo founded and leads the practice Agenda together with uh, Juliana Gallego Martinez, um, an architectural practi practice which is based in Medellin, Colombia since uh, 2010. Uh, which is in fact a key component of his uh, architectural practice. Um, um, I've, I met for the first time Camilo about uh, eight years ago, and uh, he was introduced to me as basically the, the person who could actually uh, allow me to understand the Medellin case. In fact, he has been a, a decisive figure in the contemporary architectural debate in uh, Latin America, but uh, first and foremost, uh, somebody who has actually uh, um, read uh, interrogated and deciphered uh, the case of Medellin, a kind of extraordinary case of uh, transformation of the city, but also the role that architecture has played within it. Um, by the same token, um, I would dare say that Camilo has also been a, a sort of very important force in uh, situating uh, the city and the urban question, not only at the core of his work, but also at the core of the architectural debate in Latin America at large which uh, I must say for some of us uh, had been an elusive question when we seemed to be uh, sort of doomed to uh, exclusively a discussion of architecture in Latin America at the level of the, of the region. More recently, uh, Camilo has addressed uh, other um, cliches of um, Latin American architecture, such as the tropics, which has also been um, the, the topic that he has addressed in the, in the recent uh, studios he has conducted at the GSD, which I had the, the pleasure to attend as a juror. Um, so it is, in fact, my, my pleasure to welcome Camilo to the school and a, and a privilege to have the chance to continue the conversation with him following uh, his uh, lecture. So please uh, help me welcome Camilo Restrepo. Thank you. Thank you, Enrique, for your kind presentation. I'm very glad to be here joining you today. Uh, thank you to the school, to Amal, for, the, for bringing me here and speak and share some thoughts with you. Um, I would like to, to begin with a very brief description of the territory where we perform architecture, since we believe that architecture is a description of the territory. It uh, allows things to collide, to coincide in, within the architecture, culture, social conditions, disciplinary questions, uh, climate, etc. So, so I, I, we believe that strongly architecture is this place as, as a meeting point. It's an optimistic uh, performance. Architecture is optimistic. Architects, we are optimistic because we bring this idea of transformation, of imagining things that previously didn't thought were possible. We believe architecture can have this power of changing, redescribing things as it used to be. It has this ability to redescribe reality. Uh, this is the territory where we live in. This is Colombia. This is the Caribbean Ocean, Pacific Ocean, and uh, Medellin, it's somewhere else here. Here, it, here is, this is our state, and Medellin is the capital. The state, it's called Antioquia. And it's very interesting to see this map because it brings us the, the configuration of the geography. Geography is very important for us because it's not also the surface, how it's covered the territory, but also creates a very particular case of relating with nature and relating with the resources that are available. Um, Medellin is here in the middle of, um, of a um, plateau. And um, we have a condition of uh, tropical weather of 1,400 meters above sea level. This is Medellin by night, uh, 25 kilometers long by pretty much 16 kilometers wide. And we have these uh, different uh, conditions of uh, urbanization, uh, going from informal settlements to more rigid, uh, the, the heritage of the Spanish tradition of the, of the grid, plus very different variations of historical interpretations of grids during the modern era, era between the 30s and 40s. This is a view from the north looking to the south. So you see the configuration of the city, a very narrow valley. Uh, around here it's 2,300 meters above sea level. Here it's around 1,500 meters above sea level. So we have a very dynamic climate, um, 
moving between 18 degrees Celsius to 30 degrees during whole year round. We have no seasons, so in that sense, tropic it's very boring because we only have or rain or sunny days, and that creates a very interesting case on how architecture performs under these circumstances. This is a view from the south, so you see all this industrialization along, along the river and how this gap in the city is defined by this peripheral line that the river creates. It's not um, used for, for boats, it's simply, a, let's call it a ditch of 60 meters depth. So we see all these different types of urbanization, the tower, the modern tower, residential towers from the 70s, 80s, and contemporary towers uh, colliding with these uh, informal settlements that go all around the valley, and all this force of nature that drives, which is the space that it's in between us. Uh, a couple of images of the transformation of Medellin of the last 12 years. This is the metro cable going into the northern part of the, of the city, uh, before and after of different social housing projects that were performed by the, by the government. Uh, before and after also of this requalification of the public space and through the system of infrastructure, but also how architecture plays this role of uh, giving social value to the relation between architecture and, and the people. Another one of before and after, how this uh, tissue of public space begins to create this space between the houses and the monuments, let's say in a Rossi way, how this um, uh, the creation of these monuments that bring people that drive attention in like a primary element, but also at the same time, all this informal housing that needs to be uh, performed or needs to be re-engaged, re needs to be um, still affected by these uh, logics of politics. So we have, uh, we have done this uh, small canopy here in the Botanic Garden. It's... Uh, the, the canopy for the flower exhibition of, of the Orchidiorama, as we call it. All this area became transformed in the last 14 years. All this is infer informal settlements with more than one million inhabitants. And all this has become like the northern part of, uh, the center of the northern part of the city through all these social infrastructure projects. I will go into it in a couple of minutes. But first, I will also like to describe the, the, the rural settlements, the rural environment that we have to deal with. So how architecture in this kind of record image that I showed at the beginning, how architecture moves from the R to the U, from the rural to the urban constantly, and how architecture needs to ask questions and respond to this condition in a very different sense. It's not the same to intervene uh, the urban uh, realm with architecture tools, with the architecture discipline, or intervene the rural a area or the rural domain with the architecture discipline and its tools. You need, they need to be recalibrated, they need to be um, uh, assume that they perform differently because the effect and the condition there and the context operates completely different. I will, I will go into it through the lecture. So we are, for us, the mountains are not the last frontier. We live in the mountains. It's where we live, it's how we create our environment. It's what we transform through and with architecture. So we look at these uh, different uh, vernacular um, settlements, this vernacular information that I think it's very, explains very well of the territory, how they engage and transform and settle these platforms in order to, be, to make surface flat. To make surface flat sounds a little bit absurd, but in, in Colombia it has a lot of meaning because everything is steep. So the action of making flat it's the first action that we need to engage in order to create a realm for architecture to happen. This, uh, kind of, uh, this is the kind of history we, we inherited, as there is a big difference between Colombia and other countries in Latin America. Colombia doesn't have the tradition of Peru or Mexico of having pre-Columbian heritage, doesn't have the European um, influence such as Argentina or even Peru some, in some places, or other places like Uruguay. So Colombia falls more into the side of Brazil, but without the immigration. So that makes it a very endogamic culture, a, a culture locked within itself for many different reasons. One is geography, as I have shown before, but the other one, of course, is the conflict for the last 60 years. So for us, history, it's incomplete. Um, our historical references locally 
speaking can only be uh, taken or referenced to vernacular architecture. But we see a lot of potential in these kind of situations. It's a very intelligent architecture. I will develop the idea further. So you see all these uh, kind of uh, very basic motives taken from Owen's Arts and Crafts, uh, uh, the, the Grammar of Ornament from the late 1900 that arrived with British and uh, with British um, mining engineers. So people began to adapt these uh, graphics coming from Owen's um, book into these kind of uh, climatic devices. So how we begin to adapt this foreign history into tropicalizing it, to making it our own. And then, and then this became our, our, our heritage, also mixed with the Spanish construction tradition of uh, Extremadura and, uh, and Andalusia. So we live in this kind of the cliche of the tropic. We, when we mention the tropic, we all believe that the tropic is this. It's a, it's a beach with a white sand, a blue sky, a, perhaps with a cocktail with a little umbrella in it. But, but the tropic, it's more complicated because the tropic is a condition that it's a belt that goes around many different climates, many different conditions. So the tropic is this, but at the same time is this. It's the, the Andes Mountains. It's this condition of being on top of a mountain. While here you can have 30 degrees Celsius on a warm day, here you can have minus 10 uh, degrees in a late, uh, at, at dawn. So you have all these uh, situations within the same place, within hours, driving from one place to the other one. So then how we, we began to ask our, ourselves, how do we engage into architecture to respond to this condition without being nostalgic, without being referential in the sense of being too much um, with a moral uh, approach to technique or having to explain our architecture within the social values. Because I think that one of the greatest curses of the last years is that every, th every time, and this also belongs to the cliche of the tropic, is that every time we, belong, we, we mention tropic or Latin America, we immediately tend to believe that architecture needs to be socially engaged, made by collaborative processes, uh, made within the community, and that's not necessarily. I mean, in our places, such as Colombia, architecture is always socially engaged. We just don't need to highlight it constantly to remind us of that role. So one of my concerns is, and that's my purpose as how I perform and understand the discipline, is that architecture needs to, be, needs to respond within the frame of architecture itself. And we cannot judge them out of it, because then we, then we will be talking about sociology, uh, politics, economy, or perhaps something else that doesn't bring anything back to the discipline. So I think that we need to protect our discipline, especially in these days of extreme porosity, uh, where architecture discussions are not intended as to be a station where everything arrives into architecture and becomes architecture, but the other way. Everything that we try, tend to discuss in the last years, I think it's a, it's a kind of a hijacked uh, discipline, is that we tend to discuss architecture within the realm of sociology, ecology, um, material culture, but always running away from the discussion of architecture itself. So going into the, um, the architecture, how do we understand it? I think we architects are the only discipline that create projects from, for ourselves, and we are only successful once we place the problems, and we are successful getting out of the problems we ourselves created, engaging these problems into a reality, let's call it a context, but also call it the, the compromise with our time and our region or our context. So we, we see the architecture as this crossing part between discipline that uh, constructs problem and a practice that solves problem. So we, we, this is our course. We have to, be, uh, we have to respond for very, pre very precise needs of clients, um, uh, local conditions, etc. But at the same time, we have to move our limit of the discipline a bit forward to make ourselves necessary. We have to make ourselves necessary for, our, for the sake of architecture on one hand, but also for the societies we work in. So the question is, how do we make ourselves necessary? So <clears throat> I, I go to, to a very particular drawing from Loger, uh, where, 
where all the canons of the classic order are lying below. And we see this image as a very promising image, a very complex image at the same time, because somehow what, um, what the goddess is pointing out is not only the archetype or the type and all the discussion on, on the text that have been written about this engraving before, but also what, what's, what's necessary to make architecture out of nature or what we consider nature. And what's the role of this um, limit and how, how, how this architecture, this idea of making architecture, which is tracing the limit of making inside and outside as a primary element, how do we engage and understand this when the climate and the condition and the territory allows us not to have walls? How does our architecture breathe? How does our architecture, it's able to engage into these context uh, discussions of place, site, even if, if, um, if it's precise, perhaps, in these uh, regions, how this work, but at the same time, be able to judge, uh, participate, and belong to this tradition, which is the Mediterranean history of architecture, which I consider it's the, um, it's the history of architecture. So, looking into these engravings, the, um, the creation of the, um, of the Corinthian order, it, it's a very beautiful story that Moneo also um, mentions in his uh, text about arbitrariness, but I think for us has been very useful and very beautiful to understand what architecture is about. The, um, the legend or the story tells that um, a princess or a noble girl died and a friend wanted to pay, pay homage to her and uh, brought, brought a basket weaved by hand made out of uh, fibers, put a clay uh, lid in top of it, uh, and then place it beside an acanthus uh, plant. Then the acanthus grew up in a very arbitrary way, of course, and created, and it was of such beauty and proportions that then the Corinthian order was then established. For us, it's a beautiful condition because it's this relation between what's made by hand, what's made by heat, uh, architecture, it's a mineral way of organizing matter, and that's, that can be done and explained by the clay. But also at the same time, it's what, what's, what it's between all of us, which is not graspable, it's not describable, but, a, but makes us able to relate differently, to understand what is our position, not only in the world, but among ourselves, related with what we call nature. So, so then these uh, constructions begin to evolve in a way unprecedented that we cannot explain, and then it becomes uncertain in the sense that that order that architecture plays, it's a temporary order. And we like and understand and will all the time for these kind of uh, temporary orders. Architecture is a temporary order of space. So for the first project I'm going to show you, it's an exhibition we did last year in Liga. Liga, it's a great uh, architecture gallery in Mexico City. So the first thing we engage with, it was called Tropical Canonical. Also, how we can create an order out of the tropic to explain a temporary condition made of, um, of the tropic. How, how, how could we take the tropic to Mexico City and be understood as such? So the first thing that we were looking at were these images taken by Camilo Echavarria. Camilo Echavarria, it's, a, it's an artist from Medellin, and he goes around taking pictures, and then he assembles new pictures out of it. So none of these landscapes are real. For instance, this snowy mountain here, it's Mount Fiji. Um, so he creates this atmosphere and creates this new image that doesn't exist, but explains very well the tropic. Explains very well this condition of the horizon, that I will call uh, the modern architecture. Modern architecture is more near the idea of the desert because the, the horizon is ex extremely important, this relation with depth, with depth, with a, with a line. But on the other hand, the tropic has a very different kind of space. It's a space that is made by layers. It's made like the jungle. It's a layered space. That within the same plane, uh, you have very different sizes of things that tell you very different things. In, in other words, it's a narrative made of layers. So this image also by Camilo can have this kind of a very big uh, detail of a leaf, but at the same time, the depth of the accumulation of many leaves and many details that come together. 
or this drawing by Abel Rodriguez. He is an indigenous uh, artist from Colombia that is beautiful in the sense that explains the forest, not because of the trees, but because of the leaves of the trees. So that gives us a very different relation with scale, a very different relation of depth with the space, and the detail becomes the most important part on how to construct the whole. How this homogeneous, uh, we, we can construct the whole from two perspectives. On one hand, we construct the whole departing from the homogeneity of the elements, or we can construct the whole of the heterogeneity of the parts. And I think in the topic, in this idea, these worlds collide in a very interesting way, giving us a very different sense of how we move in space. What's the threshold? What's the limit? What's the line? What's the border? And how ambiguous the elements become. So we were looking at Fish Leon Weiss uh, with the images of, uh, of the flowers and the gardens, of how all these uh, overlaying of, of different scales and images were giving us a very different sense of space, a very different sense of scale. We were looking at to, uh, Thomas Trout, um, also images of the, of the forest, of the rainforest, pretty much into the same line of Camilo Echavarria. And then we wanted to, 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 to put together two places that for us have a, a lot of meaning. One is the garden of our office, which is in this, um, in this picture, and the other one is the garden of our house. So how could we brought a place that didn't exist in Mexico for, a same, for the same experience, or at least to try to, to recall that experience and make it happening very far in a very different way, but mediated by the power of architecture? So we were looking first at the dioramas. Dioramas were these, um, it was a kind of a pre-photographic uh, experience of space where they printed into silk images of travels of the travelers of the 19th century while it was being lit behind with uh, candles and they were moving and, and moving these screens to make a kind of an animated um, landscape. So we thought that this kind of um, narrative of the late 18th and 19th century was very, was very important for us in the sense that describe our territory from a very, let's say, a Humboldt way of looking into nature that for us, not having a heritage of um, built, um, uh, built heritage, we could use it as a tool to describe our own territory and with it uh, the atmosphere that we wanted to create. Then we thought also that we could have a kind of a um, hidden layer of, uh, of history of what the city is. And Medellin was a textile city, a textile productive city for many years. This is one of the... Um, textile companies in the early 20th century. So that was another reason on why, why wouldn't we use a textile that speaks from, for our city, that, that speak, speaks for our, our history, and then begin to use history and understand history in a very um, open way. Um, let's, let's, let's slow down for a while and, and, and think that there is a very big difference and, um, and beauty about it in the history of architecture, which is that history of architecture, it's an open book that we, no matter where we come from, we can write, participate, read and understand, and then we, be, we, we, we feel it belongs to us, while the history of nations only has meaning from, for, a peop, for a person that it's originated or comes from that place. That creates a very different idea of narrative and a relation with history. Because what I'm saying, somehow what I'm suggesting is that history of architecture can be modified and no matter what happens, we will feel it belongs to us. It gives us reasons to do the things we do. It allows us to use the material of somebody else, no, no matter where it comes from, and then we can use it to our own benefit. And then we are able to rewrite a narrative that perhaps enters the realm of reality. And then we could claim, as many authors do, that reality or truth is what we made out of it. So we, were, we wanted to use also the reference of Ms. van der Rohe of uh, Café Samtunseide in Berlin, like how these elements were able to create a logic of architecture. All these textile soft borders were defining a very different relation with space, very mysteriously, very awkward in the logic of uh, modern architecture, but pretty much into Mises' uh, logic of ambiguity and undefined borders. And then we had this affection for uh, Sonsvik Pavilion from uh, Aldo van Eyck that we thought 
what happens if we put all these things together into this small space of four, 16 me square meters in Mexico City and we use the floor plan of uh, Van Eyck. So we were wondering if we could invert everything as the tropic usually does. If uh, the northern culture has taught us that things are rigid, that the light should come from above, uh, that transparency is made by glass, um, why not believe that the light won't come from above, it will go from below, more into a, an Arabic tradition. Uh, what is rigid in Sonspeak, in our case, will be flexible, it will move, um, it will be dynamic instead of static, and instead of discovering the, la the layers of opaque uh, walls, why not create in a space that is layered as the forest? So we inserted the, the whole floor plan into the corner of Liga, very, very small. This is 14 square meters. This is the, um, the gallery. So we created this um, overlay of silk um, textile printed in color with different scales of tropical nature. So as long as you were moving into the direction of discovering or unveiling this uh, line, you will see how the scale will change of the, of the patterns that were printed on the textile. So as you see, it begins to grow from flowers to bushes to plants and then to trees and then to create the whole forest. So this is what uh, came out of it. And, uh, and, and I like uh, to start this lecture with it because it somehow explains what we, what, what we think about architecture, about this very fragile border that needs to be dilated, that needs to be expanded for things to happen, to respond to a very uncertain social condition that today might be needed for a concert, but tomorrow for a, for a riot, uh, a political riot, or the other day for a car exhibition, or to be articulated as a public space, but then the other day as an enclosed garden. So we were thinking that this flexibility, this uh, permeability will allow us to create this space that it's expanded, expanded the threshold. So this is pretty much the effect of the, of, the, of the installation in the gallery. It was very high resolution print. So when you were getting close, you could see and define and recognize the patterns of the plants. But then at the same time, it was extremely ambiguous because it, it looked also at the same time as just silhouettes. And this is pretty much how it looked outside. So here a small uh, video just to, to show you a little bit how it moved how it uh, performed in the, in the space. Um, these veils of undefined uh, transparency that you could see through but not completely, that uh, they were enclosing um, a space that was made to go through, so it was not a place to stay. So all these kind of ambiguous conditions that are not black or white, but at the same time are black and white and gray, is what defines this idea of the tropical space that we are pretty much into, into trying to define, trying to work with. But, but, but at the same time, how this uh, tropical space, it, we found this kind of paradox that the more specific the elements of architecture are, the most um, ambiguous the space becomes. So it's this paradox. Once you realize a column is a column and you can read it as a column, a window is a window and it plays no tricks, it's just a window. And the wall is just a, a, a limit between inside and outside that can get porous and can create this um, ambiguous condition of letting the air through, which is not completely inside, which is not completely outside. Then, when you realize that these elements play the role it should play as the tradition of architecture has taught us in a very specific, perhaps, perhaps we could claim also conservative way, then it operates in very interesting ways in the tropic because it allows people to do whatever they want. It allows things to happen. And that's, that's a, a very important condition, how we allow things to happen, not to control the whole space, but how this space becomes negotiable, how this becomes openly enough for things that we didn't believe could happen or that we didn't expect. I will move a little bit further here with but you see how something that was rigid became dynamic, right? And something that was static, now it's uh, movable. How something that was opaque became transparent.
The, the, the next uh, project, it's uh, pretty much into the same logic. It's uh, the Chicago Architecture Biennial, uh, 2017, uh, Make New History. What's the topic of the, of the biennial? So in the same way of trying to understand or make history ours, uh, we were thinking, why not uh, take a look at the curtain wall by Mies? So we were thinking that this ambiguous idea of the words that uh, curtain wall can mean two things at the same time, uh, one, a misunderstanding, of course, and one, the understanding of it, um, could make a lot of sense. So we thought, why not um, try to create the effect, the opposite effect of a curtain wall in the northern hemisphere, which is that instead of letting the air out, we will let the air in. Everything that happens outside, we will bring it in. So instead of creating this limit, we will make it as porous as possible to connect with the outside. So misunderstanding the curtain wall, from, from Mies, we thought, okay, Mies also played with curtains, not only made of glass and iron as the constructive system, but also as his curtains in uh, Barcelona Pavilion and Samdunzaide, as I showed before. And then we bumped into this wonderful image from the Tugendhat house. So we thought, why, why not make this effect happen for real? For real and for false, in the sense that why don't we try to create a space as if all the nature has become the imprint of the materials, but they are as artificial as possible. So we thought, okay, let's give a different interpretation to all of the patterns that Mies created in his project, in most of, in most of his projects. So let's give them a tropical interpretation, a graphical composition of a device, inverting the condition from moving from a mineral order to a natural order. So the, um, the, the wall at the, um, of Onyx at the Barcelona Pavilion, we made it become an orchid. The, the stone at the outside of the Barcelona Pavilion, we made it become lichen, lichen. Uh, the other stone, we made it become moss. And the, um, the, the wood, the um, mahogany wood, we made it become uh, the trunk of a tropical tree that it's called Seiba. Okay, and, and the other one of the, um, of the Barcelona Pavilion, and that it's also present in uh, Lakeshore Drive, we made it become the depth of the forest. So we created all these different patterns of uh, leaves, forests, uh, lichens, flowers, etc., into a new order to create and define a space. So we were getting back again to the, to the Loge uh, engraving, thinking about what's inside and what's outside and how we could uh, define and recreate this idea uh, 200 years after the Loger idea of, the, of architecture and the archetype and the illustration ideals of architecture. So we invited uh, Camilo Echavarria, the, the photographer, to take some pictures of the coffee growing region in Medellin, which is uh, one hour, two hours from Medellin, 100 kilometers where we made a building for processing, processing coffee that I'm showing. So we thought, why don't we use the logic of Mies, of the, um, of the um, curtain wall, with the logic of our project for processing coffee that has also a curtain wall, but instead of being transparent, it's opaque, and it's full of holes to let the air go through, which is completely the opposite. And at the same time, let's invite Camilo to create um, a narrative of the site, of that context, and put all these things together. So we invite Camilo Echavarria to take these photos, and another Camilo, Camilo Echeverri, to take photos of uh, our project. So it was a uh, Camilo's collaboration, and, uh, and this is the images that Camilo found. This is one of these small huts that are used for people to wait coffee before they sell it to a provider. And we thought, okay, let's, let's bring the relations and they will come together once they are, they are there. So this is one of the images. Then also the image of the Fansworth house under construction. These elements, these primary elements, also in relationship with these two other images that I showed before. Then this vernacular architecture to dry coffee. This is our project. This is the, um, the system for a floating facade or curtain wall, but then used 
completely for the opposite purpose, just to have a, temp a, a cover and let the air go through. Then also the lecture drive under construction. One of the only heritage we have there, which is these coffee infrastructural buildings to dry and process coffee from the 19th century, which operate in a very precise way, as I mentioned before, a slab is a slab and you can read it as such. The columns are columns and you can read it as such. So it's no trick in it. It's very direct, very pragmatic, very objective, very defined in its elements. An image also of the threshold between inside and outside of the Fansworth house. The threshold, which is very important for us, this image of the coffee growing building from the 19th century, this limit that defines an inside and an intermediary space that is not completely in or out, that intermediates between inside and outside, a temporary space. Then another image of the description of the site by Camilo. Some, we put together some historical images of uh, sugarcane processing mills of the 19th, 18th century. This one, it's in the Caribbean. But also, again, the, the, the rationality of the elements, the objectivity of each one of them. And then also how we used all this logic of cutting through the wood to let the air go through that we will reinterpret it in our project. And then our project on this side, described and depicted by, by Camilo. So then how this curtain wall began to allow the air to come through. And then the project on the site, making reference not only and connecting not only with the vernacular architecture, but also with this logic of the traditional or the history and the heritage of modern architecture. How this idea of nature in Latin America since the 18 and 1900 was to bring nature into the inside. Nature happens inside, not outside. So it inverts the logic of how we define space this engraving also from the 19th century. And then the, the region where, where the project is. And of course, these des descriptions by, by Humboldt of the, of the floors of, uh, over, height, of, over sea level that were also depicted by the nearby mountains taken also by Camilo. So we put all these things together in a small niche in a very long uh, hallway more or less 60 meters long by four meters wide in the Chicago Architecture Biennial in the Chicago Cultural Center. So we were using all these references of wood, cutting, uh, the elements, the ceiling, how the light came from below in a very in an Islamic tradition, more than Northern tradition, and how our project begins to create this logic of this box that gets perforated by just letting the air go through. So this was the, the hallway that we got. And this is the, the installation. So we created all this niche, creating these walls of bringing this atmosphere of humidity, of warmth, of climate, of this tension between these spaces that you had to wander around to discover and see what was inside. So inside were these images that I'm showing you and some others as well. So we were putting into contradiction many historical images from vernacular architecture that has no pedigree, that nobody knows who did it, but at the same time contrasting with this logic, this rationale brought by Mies, especially being in Chicago and especially having the chance of bringing this ambiguity to, to tropical architecture through the modern masters. Another detail. Okay, so entering into the project of the community coffee mill, it's, it's a box, as simple as that, of 66 meters long by 38 meters wide. It's to process coffee. That means that once the cherry gets uh, taken out of the tree, the cherry is the red thing. Inside, it's a knot. The knot is the one that goes to roasting, and it's the one we, we, we drink, let's say. So, so the process here, it's between grabbing the cherry and drying it, and then taking the, the knot to a roasting company. So it's all this in-between uh, process. So the box has uh, all these machines to dry, to wash, to ferment the coffee, all these 
happens here in a linear process that I'm not going to go into the detail of it. And then we talk with the, with, with, um, with the client. Why not bring a little bit of social responsibility also here to allow the kids and the farmers, because this is for a cooperative, to have a small community center. So it's a mixed program of uh, processing coffee and at the same time educational facility, which is a more or less 80 square meters. So the process is very simple. Uh, the coffee arrives in a, in a truck here, gets down, gets washed, then they take the peel off and goes into a compost uh, pile. Then the knot gets into water for 12 hours, then it gets washed again, and then it gets dried in an oven. That's pretty much what, what the program is about. So this is, this is the main uh, hall of the, of, the, of the warehouse, and this is where all the compost goes in, in beside it. So the section was very simple. This is pretty much uh, 14 meters. Uh, with, a, with a roof uh, supported by this beam around, this is around 3 meters 50. And we, we created a device for all the air to let in because since the oven, uh, the process of drying the machine implies oven, so therefore implies uh, heat and therefore it goes with a steam. 65% 60, of the component of the bean of, of the cherry, it's water. So inside, this is a steam machine. So we, we needed to get rid of the steam very quick. So we open here the facade below for the cold air to go up, and we open it in the top for the steam to go out. So, so we also wanted to take um, uh, advantage of that to create a spatial uh, effect that will be more dramatic and will, will also create a, an atmosphere inside of it. So this is the, the location of the, of the building. This is for 1,200 families, located, uh, as I mentioned, 100 kilometers southeast from Medellin. A very simple structure, uh, a block, uh, with three layers of, um, of perforations. Uh, this is made of uh, ultra, um, of concrete with a color and, um, and uh, fiberglass, so they are lighter. This is the process of ensembling, putting them into this curtain wall, hanging them one by one. We chose this material in prefab because of the difficulty of bringing supplies to this area. So it was easier to produce all this and bring it there. We are committed with the materiality of our projects for two reasons. One, we are committed and understand that labor is completely limited. So we don't want or we don't need to try to create something out of the blue that nobody can build. But also at the same time, we tend to move between this kind of idea of um, stereotomy and um, tectonic idea of architecture, because I guess these two conditions of space relate very differently according to the climate or the condition where it is um, settled. This is the, the, the project outside. This is the compost. So we engraved all the, um, some of the panels with these kind of uh, motifs coming from this uh, in reinterpretation of history made by the people in this area, thanks to the books brought by the mining engineers in the 19th century, coming from the Grammar of Ornament by Owen. So we created these panels. The one on top with this kind of diamond shape for the air to go out. And these ones uh, engraved with all this uh, graphic representation, this ornament of uh, what, what it's already in these towns around the, 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 around the project. A very simple structure, very rational, I will say, and with, with this kind of uh, effects to the inside. Joints and construction detailing was very simple. It's basically a mesh, a grid of a steel structure covered with concrete panels, as simple as it could as it could be. Almost a no detail architecture in the sense that we didn't have to solve all the problems of labor and construction system out of just a few drawings. 
this has become somehow a, a center for the community. So kids go there to, to learn and, and see other information and get other information, connect to internet, Wi-Fi. And this is the effect I was telling you about the, the steam inside, which is, I, I think it's very beautiful for a, for a facility, for just a factory. Then I'm gonna be very brief with the Orchidorama. The Orchidorama is a competition we won in 2005 in association with my father, J. Paul Restrepo, and my, and my friends from Plan B Architects. It's a, it's a canopy for the Botanic Garden. Uh, it's mainly uh, a structure made of steel built on site. There is no prefab here. Everything was built on site. This is pine wood. And the idea was to create and to expand this threshold again. Um, how we were able to bring inside and outside without you even notice it by just creating a, a, a canopy. How we will manage and calibrate the border of the building. How we will set roofs against walls, let's say, make an echo of uh, Lina Wawardi's text of uh, stones against diamonds. We were, more, we were thinking more about roofs against walls in the sense that in the tropic, it's more important the roof than the wall because it allows you to provide shade, to provide a cover space, a multi-purpose space that it's able to adapt to many conditions by a very simple floor plan. So this changes during the, the day, uh, with rain, without the rain, uh, with uh, a, a festival of uh, music or a, a capoeira class or the very different situations. So it, it, it operates in a very interesting way, which is like a semi-covered uh, public space available for people 24 hours a day. There is also a small video here <coughs> that uh, explains how it's used. It, it changes um, with, with, the, with the days and, and how people engage there. The, the idea was to have 10 structures that we call flower tree, which is uh, mainly seven hexagons, where the one in the middle, it's always a void, that has a special garden down below. And then each one of them had a different garden with orchids or tropical flowers. Uh, for the competition, we thought it was gonna be 14 of these structures, but due to budget, uh, it was shortened into 10. But somehow, since we thought about it in a way of a system that was solved only by defining one of these elements, uh, no matter the shortage in budget, the building stayed the same. But now, it, it, it has become very interesting in the logic of the city, of the everyday life. People go there to practice uh, music, to just spend uh, an afternoon there, and, uh, and it has become a very successful public space that that expands, again, this ambiguous territory between inside and outside. Uh, the, the wood, it's uh, pine wood from a sustainable crop near the, that, that it's brought near Medellin. And uh, it's, uh, it's um, polycarbonate for the ones that are transparent, transparent and a metallic tile for the ones that doesn't let the air go through. So it creates also this uh, condition as if we were into the, into the forest, into this uh, space made of layering, but that here, we're going to be mixed with this idea of the horizon, this ambiguity between very, being very tropical, but at the same time allowing you to see through the, the space, which is something that it's more, more from the northern tradition of architecture. Then, just to finish, <clears throat> this is a school we just finished last year. It's also in association with my father, J. Paul Restrepo, and it's located 300 kilometers south from Medellin, near a city that is called Cali. Uh, this is a place called Jumbo. This is a uh, sugar cane plantations and this is uh, an informal settlement. So we thought that the, the piece that we were doing there from a very symbolic uh, approach, it had to create order there. It had to be monumental. It had to create a certain relation that wasn't previously there in order to create a different social logic, a very different logic with the territory. So the, um, the, the project, it's mainly a box, again, a square, a cube, that tries to keep only one material in a very monolithic uh, condition, also making echo of uh, this povera, let's say, condition of just having to cast one, one material, having to deal only with one condition, but at the same time have the strength of the tectonic as if it was arising 
from the geology that was present there. This is, this is the, the site, a very complicated site because it has uh, 16 contours from here to here, that means 16 meters from this point to this point, sorry. And then also in, on to this side, it was the previous school. So they had to work almost on top of the school without stopping classes. And then from here to here, it also goes down like eight meters. All these houses here are invading the site illegally. So they had to take care of all the neighbors. So we thought that the best option was really to create a very basic shape, uh, making echo but inverting the typology of the patio. In the, in the typical typology of the patio, the corridor are inside, the corridors are inside, allowing the privacy to happen for the exterior part of the building. But we thought that we needed to make it the other way around. Due to the climate that it's uh, around 34 degrees Celsius year round. So we thought, so let's place the patio in the middle in a very gridded um, or rigid grid that we will take the ramp to the corner of the mountain, the entrance to the other, let's say, the bay of the, of the terrain, and allowing people just to circulate in the perimeter, always protecting the core of the building as a, um, as a way of making air flow and allowing children to play inside without falling off the building, because that was pretty, that was pretty much restricted. So on the first floor, we have uh, the cafeteria and the restaurant of the building. This is a 1,700 square meters building. Uh, the library, uh, the kindergarten, and the infant uh, stimulation room. And on the second floor, it's just uh, rooms in a cross uh, diagram uh, shape of a functional distribution, and uh, some double heights that were taking place especially in the hall of the entry of the school and on the library. But then, again, how the type was changed to bring the circulation to the perimeter. You can see it here. It's, this, this was the most important topic for the interior of the building, which in the end is not an interior. It's, again, the exterior. Then the, um, the, the roof uh, with a slope to one side to get the most uh, of the light as possible without getting the heat. Also, these elements began to play a very important role to cut the noise up there. So they had an angle that was calculated to cut the, um, the waves, the sonic waves of noise here. And also this element to cut the afternoon sun. In, in the tropic, the sun is not, uh, is not something you wish to have. It's something that gives you problems. So somehow you are protecting all the time from the sun. So this is the double height of the, of, the, of the library and a very beautiful space, which is the ramps and the double height of how you circulate. So for us, circulation was very important, how you move in the building and around the building, how you get different images of the landscape through the building, how we understood the building as a device to understand the topography, as a device to see the landscape, as a device to understand the space, the space that it's below you, but also at the same time, how you can create this intimate problem, that, that, that intimate uh, space, sorry, that was at the same time very porous to the, to the outside view. You will see it in the images. So we made this monolithic uh, idea of models casted in concrete, a very rigid, very rational, very monumental, uh, orthogonal, very architectonic uh, stamina presence into the site, just with a cut to allow the, 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 cut, the sun to, cut, to be cut by this perimeter, but at the same time to have and spend most of the time around the school, not inside of the, of the rooms. In that sense, people will learn through the halls, will, will, will be likely to spend more time in the perimeter than inside the, um, the classes, just with a few details to cut and edit and do a kind of an addition of the landscape through the building that you will see in the images. So this is the, the presence of the, of the building in top of the mountain, pretty much like a temple, a monument in top of the, of the neighborhood. This is the, the materiality, a reddish, uh, yellowish uh, concrete using the sand from the, from the site, that, which is this color. Very rough in its definition. 
also at the same time making echo of this uh, threshold that I showed before in the project from the 19th century, which is, I think, the, a very good description of how the, the tropic is defining its condition on, on, if, on its uh, spatial condition, how you begin to see this huge balcony over the, um, the, the valley, how a typology that it's always used for one or two people to get together, which is the balcony, then becomes the whole balcony. Then a space which is to move around becomes a, spa a space to be in. So it begins to cut all these perspectives from the outside to mark stuff or things that happen outside while it creates a very precise order on the, on the site, but at the same time a very ambiguous relation within inside and outside. This huge balcony for the community and for the people. How the, the, um, the restaurant operates between these two spaces. This is looking into the courtyard. This is looking out into, into the view. Then the double height of a very precise spatial condition. One vertical, one horizontal space condition with the light, with the proper light to, to see without needing to turn on the lights. And then these small devices to cut the, the landscape that it's outside. All these elements to protect from falling. This is, you will see it in another image, it's eight or 10 meters above the ground in this place. So all these small elements that begin to play a kind of ornament uh, dealing with uh, elements from the history of architecture, like uh, making a little bit of a homage here to Marcel Breuer. But the ramp again coming up, coming down of these uh, very well lit elements and the light going through around. And how could you see through this layer the space, which is pretty much this, how you could see many layers of space within the same device. The, the courtyard again, with the elements to cut the noise and, and the sun at a certain time of the day. And uh, this glimpse of this uh, little, um, yeah, li li like, uh, I missed the word, like, uh, paying attention to these things that were near in the, last, in the landscape, how, the, how it got cut. You see the materiality is very rough. It's extremely rough because labor doesn't give you more than that. So we were thinking about if it's going to be rough, let's make it very, very rough. So making use of the resource of the handmade as, as a quality and not as a problem. We, we, we cannot pretend to build as if we were Swiss. So you see this is the, the, the difference of level here. And yeah, I mean about the Swiss thing because when you go to Switzerland, you feel so bad. You see these concretes and they are all smooth, precise. Uh, they really feel like concrete, no? This uh, sometimes feels like stone, sometimes feels like uh, wood. Sometimes uh, the borders don't even match, but then you, you see that it's also a possibility of redescribing the materiality in those terms, of how things have a, a strength of being its own by the roughness of it, of the naturality. And uh, this is pretty much the, the school from the outside with, uh, with, the, with, the, with, the, um, with, with this huge balcony going around. So we were thinking pretty much of how to make this type of space, making it the whole definition of it, a courtyard and a balcony for everybody to, to enjoy. I guess that's pretty much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, is it working? Yeah, it is. Thank you very much for, for your lecture, Camilo. It's always a pleasure to, to hear and also to have the chance to continue the, the conversation. Um, I'd like to go uh, 
to basically address some of the various practices that you engage. The, your, your lecture was more focused on, on practice, but I'd like to also um, go back to uh, some of the other practices that you've engaged since the beginning, um, whether it's uh, uh, basically engaging architecture as a thinker, writer, as a teacher, and in fact as a designer. It's, uh, it's absolutely true that uh, the first time I heard about you was uh, when probably 2011, 12, I had learned about the case of Medellin and, and I asked a few people uh, to learn more about it and uh, everyone basically pointed to, uh, to you saying, well, Camilo Restrepo is the person you have to talk to basically. He, he was the one who sort of uh, had uh, been um, discussing the topic, examining it, uh, uh, describing it, and in fact you, you lectured extensively on it uh, and that's in fact how we uh, met. So. It, um, so I would say that basically for, you, you were sort of the, on the younger side of the Medellin uh, um, experiment and, um, and you became in fact uh, the a protagonist by virtue of examining it. So um, it was very refreshing to me precisely and we've shared this because basically the, for, for many of us the sort of discussion in, uh, in Latin America was uh, traditionally reduced to the question of the region. In fact, as you discussed, Switzerland. Um, it's, it's not... Uh, to the question of the city, and it was refreshing to see that basically Medellin was being was taking hold of the conversation at the level of the city. So um, you basically very much define a sort of a agenda work by discussing Medellin. So I'd, I'd like to basically uh, ask you at, at this stage when you're basically more focused on on practice and practice as its own uh, um, let's say condition that usually takes you to uh, the questions that are uh, driven by the very projects that you are uh, asked to uh, address. I would like to ask, in which way are you basically now engaging uh, questions that were opened by, by, by you uh, about the city as you engage basically uh, design and more openly the question of practice? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> it's, it's not an easy question, but um, I, I guess we have a... Um, we have moved for the last years in a very um, unexpected direction, I would say. I didn't expect to move toward the topics that I'm interested in right now. But I realized that we were able to make the city new somehow, but we don't know anything about its past. And uh, somehow, while a lot of territories has been, have been activated due to the peace process, we have discovered a lot of regions, urban, re uh, rural regions, even the wilderness, that have a lot of uh, heritage, that it, now it's endangered. Somehow, what, what has happened is that from one day to the other one, pretty much like that, a veil fell, which was the conflict in the sense, I mean, I'm not saying the conflict disappeared, but somehow a lot of territories that were completely abandoned were available to be visited. And then when you begin to go there, you see a lot of uh, protected heritage due to violence, paradoxically, which is this front, rural frontier that opened. And then suddenly we were facing a country that we don't know, a country that we don't understand, a country that um, we, don't, we don't know what's going on. So I thought, that why not understand the history of architecture, not only performing in the cities, but also outside of them, can create a different narrative on who we are. I mean, sounds a very stupid purpose, but because, because it sounds, uh, I mean, asking yourself who you are today is not the same of asking who you are 100 years ago. But then you see all this heritage, you see, how we tear down all the cities, uh, pretty much our historical centers in all the country, beside uh, Cartagena city center, a little bit in Bogota, a little bit of Popayan, a city to the south, all our cities have been completely demolished. So then I'm saying it's an unexpected because for a period of time, you want, you want to play the vanguard uh, perspective, right? But then you realize that the vanguard or trying to play this vanguard requires an understatement, an, an understatement, which is that if you want to play the vanguard, you have to know what's before. So we, it, it has taken us to a path that it's very weird, I will say. I had very bad history teachers, uh, very bad theory teachers too. 
So somehow I'm making, I'm trying to do the homework I didn't do at school, which is go back to the uh, seminal texts of architecture, trying to understand what's the relation with the situation we face now in a very pragmatic way, what happens with the city, what happens with rurality. And then mysteriously, all the authors that were completely boring at the time we were studying, they all make sense. So, so it's a very weird situation. We, we understand the city and um, rurality in this codependence. They need each other, and we need to come with a, a certain amount of ideas on how to intervene in these places. Because not only from a responsible point of view of social responsibility, but also what will be the role of architecture there? Uh, would it be to urbanize what previously didn't have any urban condition? I'm not so sure. Would it be to keep it as it is? I'm not so sure. I, I, so I think it's, um, it's the right moment to ask how we make ourselves necessary. That's right. pretty much what we are into. Right. Would, would you also say that your push towards the city um, was uh, both basically an opportunity because there were things happening in Medellin that made basically discussion on the city, but also on the city through the architectures, through basically, it's a city that changed through yeah. a number of very precise buildings. So the, the Rossi reading is very uh, important there. But would you say that what was a component or also, uh, as we've discussed, you're moving away from the traditional reading of South American architecture as regional. Um, yes. In fact, the, it's a, it was a sort of a, a pitfall that uh, for many, many years, uh, South American architects could not discuss anything but uh, the region. So to what extent would you say you were aiming at one or the other? Yes, I, I think that Latin America has had two very bad, well, well, not two very bad, but, but two situations that have, that have not well fitted into the um, condition of architecture itself. One, it's when Aravena gets to be the curator of the biennial. It's fantastic, I mean, Latin America, their plane, but then a veil fell immediately over the perception of Latin America, which is that all architecture needs to be socially engaged. And I think that has taken us to a very weird path, which is that the cliche of Latin America now, it's expected to be either regional in the critical regionalism tradition of Mr. Frampton from the 60s and 70s, from the 70s, or this social engaged architecture. So somehow we have made ourselves out of the disciplinary discussion that needs to be engaged within the realm of history, theory, and the autonomy of architecture for some instance. And then we fall off this kind of train. The train is going into a direction we, are f we felt off the train for a long time ago. So how to create a narrative of uh, your work, of your responsible commitment with your context, of course, but at the same time be able to play the game of the disciplinary thoughts that need to be discussed at the same time. Because in the end, while when we jump off the train and we believe that architecture is about social responsibility only, which is in fact a, a big deal of it, then sociologists, anthropologists, or whoever speaks on the name of architecture within that frame can do the work better than us. I mean, if you need to engage with a bunch of sociologists to do a project, then the sociologist will do the project better than you do. Because you are not able to put what's important for the discipline in the line and make yourself believable. Then you begin to talk as a sociologist, as an ecologist, and you cannot do that. You are not trained for that. Precisely along the lines of, of this uh, question that you, in fact, introduced in a slide before about uh, working between the the, let's say the discipline and the practice um, and, and trying to basically work specifically within the field of architecture. How would you say uh, the question of, uh, of the tropics entered uh, the equation in your work? I mean, I, I remember um, that we discussed it in, uh, in, in your studios at the GSD. Yeah. Um, it's also linked to some of the programs that you were facing. In fact, orchids or coffee immediately uh, push you uh, there. So, and in fact, uh, it's often the case that basically an architect, as soon as he, she engages practice, practice starts basically introducing forcibly the topics and, very, and yeah. randomly, basically. That's, uh, in fact, uh, the, um, the case. So, so in which way would you say that the, the question of the tropics, which is uh, both uh, its potential, as you said, and, and the pitfalls of the cliché, has uh, allowed you to basically take further some of the issues that you were engaging uh, before through uh, the city? Yeah, I think that 
um, when when you spend too much time, I mean, and we, we, we've done it, trying to create a narrative, a, a purpose, let's call it a purpose. What's the purpose of our architecture? And then you see that if you speak about social conditions, social conditions change all the time. And then it's very hard to build on top of that. Then when you try to work on technology, it's impossible. We have no technology as advanced technology. Then, I mean, you begin to check a lot of boxes, and then in the end you, le you are left with theory, history, and what you see all day, which is trees and flowers and more trees and more flowers and more nature and more pretty boring the same climate in the sense that it's rain or sun, that's it. So then you ask the question, I mean, it took me uh, uh, many years, but then how you can connect this and make it belong to a history of architecture? And then we began to use texts such as Ungas of the archipelago in the city, uh, the city within the city, to see what happens if we take these ideas into a tropical city, what will happen? Or what will happen if we are able to describe the tropic within the representation collage system of Ms. van der Rohe? What will happen? And then we began to discover through the work of uh, some students that are here, former GSD students, that uh, it was possible to create another narrative out of these elements of architecture that in the end, as I mentioned before, are as open as you want them to be. How we can use the hist history as an open text to create a narrative that begins to make sense as much as you are willing to push for it. It's uh, som sometimes, of course, you force it too much and it doesn't work, but then you are able to redirect and focus on something else to keep on building on top of it. For example, the, the work of Rossi. I, 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 while I was a student, I felt uh, completely out of it. I mean, it was complicated, it's too hermetic, it's too personal sometimes. It's a bad writer. Yes. Yeah, it's a very bad writer. It's, a, it's very good for um, turning on the light on what architecture can be, because it's like a promise, it's not a real think, but then with the years you realize that what he's actually describing and the role he's placing the practice in makes a lot of sense, especially for contexts such as ours, where things have no meaning. So then it, it begins to make sense or, yeah, or, or the text of Ungas. So then you begin to try, try to adapt to this and create a melange of, uh, of these things and try to grow from that. I have to accept that it's an ongoing process. Eh? Right. It's I, I must say I really enjoy the, the provocation of the tropics because it's, uh, I think it's a high-risk game because you're, you're really on the edge of, the, of returning to the question of the region. Yeah. Um, so, it's, so it's really the, the sort of space where you can actually exploit maximum potential or, or fall miserably on whatever yes. you're escaping from. Yes. Uh, so I think it's a phenomenally interesting uh, Topic. I feel that I should open the questions uh, and not monopolize the debate. Um, so, um, please, who's, who has the first question? Unless you want to respond to no, my... No, I, yeah, I, I, I will add... Give the last word. No, 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 don't worry. I would like to add that if it goes wrong, that it has a very big amount of going wrong, it will be seen as the worst uh, moral nostalgia. Right, right, right. Which well, will drown the boat. I think it would, it's, it would be interesting to see whether it, where it, it intersects again the questions of the city. Yeah. There's a microphone behind you. Thank you. Uh, hi. Thank you for the great lecture, for coming. Um, I want to ask a question about uh, the references that you mentioned throughout the lecture. Um, you talked a lot about uh, history of architecture, and uh, uh, in a way, I liked the way it was dialoguing, or let's say also in conflict with some other ingredients that you show up today, like nature, like tropics, as Enrique mentioned before, or the vernacular. Um, but I was curious about uh, why those specific references, rather than others you mentioned, uh, Marcel Breuer, Lina Bobardi, I think you showed almost 10 images of, uh, of me as 
So why those specific references and how they come, become part of your process also? Thank you. Um, I, I think when, when you have the, um, the will to connect things that seem to be disconnected, you have to go for the big ones already. I mean, it, it wouldn't make sense if I will go for X architect, no? Because the availability of information will be more at hand. Uh, and also at the same time, Mies has become a very interesting architect for me in its specificity of the elements, but in its ambiguity of space. Uh, visiting some of the projects, you realize and you question yourself how such very precise elements create such ambiguous space that you cannot describe formally, in the sense that you read the you read the floor plan and you see the section, and it doesn't match. Uh, it, it doesn't correspond in the way, for example, a section by Aldo Rossi will correspond with the floor plan. They are basically the same. In, in Mies, it's not the same. And once you visit the place, it's completely something else. So I was wondering why not go for these kind of uh, experiments? I mean, I will say our work in that sense is quite experimental on trying to bring something out of the blue sometimes. But, but at the same time, since you don't have any reference of historical heritage, it's very hard to create a narrative when you don't have history. If you go, uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, yeah, a couple of weeks ago, I was, I was in Madrid and in Switzerland. And the whole city is a museum for good and bad. Also in Switzerland, the whole country is a museum for good and bad. You see this building and you have a reference why it happened, it has a lineage. This guy made it because he worked with this and this and this and there is a chain of information that goes from one generation to the other one. We, I'm sorry to say what I'm about to say, but we are just a bunch of bastards. We have no masters, unfortunately. So each one of us has to invent a wheel somehow in a profession that has hundreds of wheels. So we try, we spend too much time trying to learn from somebody that it's around, which is not around. I mean, if you go to Spain, for sure you work for, or at a certain moment work for, for Juan and Iñaki, and then for Alejandro de la Sota, and then you can go back two or 300 years. If you go to Colombia, you work for, I don't know, you, you never work for somebody, and, and that's a problem. That's a problem from the discipline, for the cultural responsibility of the discipline, and for the environment. So, so going back to the question, I'm going too far, but, but going back there, I thought, okay, if we don't have any masters, let's use the masters that history tells us that are the masters, and trying to do, to learn from them, even from books. Does it fall? I think there should be a microphone <coughs> behind you. Thank you. I think that my fear is kind of um, post-rationalizing Colombian architecture to be something that it's not because Colombian architecture is a celebration of the vernacular. Um, and what I kind of reference to is like, what's happening in East Africa? In East Africa, in Colombia, you can study architecture. Um, in East Africa, architecture programs are not set up. Architecture isn't something that one can go to school to study. Um, and it's kind of like, what needs to happen um, is kind of like not, I don't know, I, I don't understand the process of like applying Mies van der Rohe to the Colombian vernacular when it should be celebrated. If we're celebrating the tropics, if we're celebrating like everything that is uniquely Colombian, why are we like bringing in another set of ideas? Yeah. Well, I think that we have to accept something that it's politically incorrect, but it's a reality. Okay. Um, I think there are first level countries in architecture and second level countries in architecture. Um, we cannot claim that, I mean, there are 
the history of architecture has been written by Europeans, and the history of architecture is European, we have to accept it. And uh, either we understand it and try to belong to it, or we are outside of it. I don't think as the world is organized, as narratives are organized, as the landscape of powers are organized, I don't think for a long time a Latin American architect will write a seminal book of architecture. Either will participate to the discussion of architecture itself. If you go through history, you cannot call 10 names of uh, Latin American architects that participated in this logic. Modernism is quite an exception, of course, because everybody wanted to be modern in, for many reasons. Uh, but beside some of the Brazilians, everything is out of the picture. And we have, I mean, it, it, if we accept that, that it's unfair to be Colombian or Chilean or, uh, I don't know, or African in the discussion of architecture, then we can set, you can make a point. Otherwise, we will always be left aside. So I think it's, it's more an acceptance of a reality and willing to fight it from within than attacking it from outside. So it's a matter of kind of perceiving the world of architecture through the lens that's already uh, prescribed to us. And then perhaps once we kind of understand it at a different level, we may hopefully be able to be a part of the conversation that starts to revolutionize the world of architecture. I mean, for example, th th just take a look at this. Most of the literature that has been written about the pre-Columbian ruins of Mexico and Peru are written into a European code. And that's why it's important. We have to accept we live in a European society. Somehow, either we like it or not. For the last 400, that's the order of the world. The European values, and I, and I have to say, I love them. That's what makes our culture our culture and your culture, and that's why we are sitting here. Because there is a mega culture that is the European culture. And that's, that's what it's about right now. And everything is getting mixed right now. I mean, for many years, Europe was the rule. Now things are changing, of course. But if we don't know their books, we cannot write ours. Interesting. Great. Thank you. Yeah, there's one question at the back. Oh, two. two. Sorry. Um, so you, you, you're talking about like the architecture in Colombia and in Latin America being, the, the architecture nowadays tends to be you know, socially responsive or seems to be getting regionalist. So that's, that's the same question that, that we deal with with architecture in India. Like the only solution is either you be regionalist or you, be, like, you have a social response to something so what do you think is the next step forward? Like, how do you break away from this? Yeah, I think that's why, I think you described the situation very well between these two sides. So that's why I want to be disciplinary driven first. Okay. If I cannot engage into disciplinary questions, then I fall into one of these buckets as much as I try hard not to, <laughs> but, right. but I guess that for many in your mind, when, when somebody tells you, okay, architecture from Latin America, you expect an Aravena situation like, or one of these things. And, and I think that it's fantastic that these people exist, that they create the projects they do, but, but we cannot play the same, I, I'm not able to play the, that game. So that's why I try to go disciplinary to the core of it mm -hmm. with the risk of burn and fail, but, right. <laughs> but, I, I but think, I'm trying. Okay. I, I think that the question you're, you're claiming is, is more, rather than a, let's say, you're not questioning socially responsible architecture or regional architecture, yeah. but the cliches that yeah, usually exactly. are, yeah, are yeah, going yeah. hand in hand with uh, many of them. Yeah. So I think that that's basically what I would say is uh, where you frame the, the discussion. That's true, and, and it's more contextual to like, like third world countries. So that's what, like, maybe that's where the question's coming from. Or again, sorry? No, the, 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 the response of architecture is more third world where you try to be socially responsive or you try to be regionalist. So like, can discipline drive the architecture in those regions? Yeah, or is it like, do you think there's something else to it? 
Oh, I, I, th I think that by, by force, every project we do or we are engaged, it's socially driven. But, right. but I don't feel comfortable uh, highlighting that because, because, we, because it's not necessarily. I mean, I, I like to be measured and have the discussion within the disciplinary boundary of it, not, without, not within the morality or the right. compromise of how responsible we are with, with the people that it's around. I mean, we, we are absolutely responsible. We try to do our best to provide the best quality of architecture within the budget, uh, respecting the client, respecting the local right. traditions, bringing them and bringing everybody the best that we can do. But, but, but I, I would say it's unfair to try to present ourselves as a social a liberator as a Robin Hood in a way right. and, and I think that flows overflows the media right now and, and that's not what we need I guess I, I guess that we need to make ourselves necessary from f from the points of view that I mentioned before in the sense that you are able to provide a very good building mm -hmm. and that can be discussed as architecture that of course provides a social service but th let's not discuss the social service in the way perfect thank you Thank you. <clears throat> a lot of your work uh, seems to be driven by the fact that you're in a mild, moderate climate and you don't have the expenses that we have here in the north. Is that one of your main advantages? That, that, uh, or is there any limitation in certain months of the year when basically some projects are less usable or something? You're right. I mean, I, I guess that's an advantage in the sense that we don't isolate walls. I mean, for us, a wall can be 10 centimeters wide, and that's pretty much everything. That, that gives us an advantage in the sense of dealing with the climate, but it's a disadvantage in how limited our material palette is. So we are pretty much boxed to use two or three materials because uh, it's what you get it's uh, what it's available, it's what labor can make out of it. And in that sense, when you belong to a culture that has seasons, you have something that we don't have, which is planning. You have to plan for the winter, you have to plan for the fall, you have to plan for the summer, and we don't do it. Since we have the same climate all year round, three months uh, rain, three months sun, three months rains again, three months rain again, and three months sun again, the building is pretty much the same. It's, it's quite boring in that sense. But, but I guess it's an advantage in the sense that the elements that play the role there are very simple. And the code, it's very simple. I mean, from the perspective of um, liabilities, from the perspective of uh, engineering, it's a very open practice and very free in that sense. And certainly none of the free saw that we have up here in the north, I guess. <laughs> No, not at all, not at all. If, if the temperature goes quite low, it will be six degrees, and it will be a dawn in perhaps in Bogota, but where I come from, the average is 23 degrees all year round. So when it's cold, it's 14, and when it's warm, it's 30, something like that. So it's uh, the, same, the same gap, let's say, the same, not, not the gap, the same uh, line of temperature. It's very stable in that sense. So I think it's an advantage in the sense that you don't have to put too many things on, 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 onto the architecture. I think we have time for one more question. There's a microphone arriving. Yeah. I wonder if you could talk about the relationship that you have with the uh, artist that you're working with. I mean, you, a couple times you mentioned the photographer, then another photographer. Uh, the films obviously are made by a cinematographer. Um, how, what is the relationship that in the practice, I don't know, for instance, like the, the printed um, uh, uh, screens, are, are, if they're your designs or you're working with a, with a, with a graphic designer. I wonder if you could talk about how, how artists um, are working with you, or you're working with artists to kind of think about your project, your practice. Yeah, yeah. We we. I, I think photography it's it's fantastic in the sense that it's a way of looking into things. It's a way of letting things in and out of the picture. 
it's a way of editing what you see. And I think architecture pretty much plays the same role. Eh? It suggests some things that could be this or that according to the way you frame uh, or define the spaces around. So we work very close with uh, Camilo Echavarria, this photographer. His topic, somehow recent topic, it's this, what he calls illustrated landscapes. So he's trying to depict the, tro the tropical landscapes with the logic of the romantic uh, artist of the late 18th and 19th century. And he creates this collage of uh, images that I showed you before as, as, um, as landscapes. And, and I found our way of doing architecture in a very similar way. You have a, a very European frame of looking into things, but then the subject of matter is not European at all, but then you have to put them together within that methodology. So we have these conversations of how we put things together in, uh, I, would, uh, I don't know if it's a collage in that sense, but, but how we put um, things that contradict itself together. So for the textiles, we work with uh, Joanna Bohanini. She's a graphic and textile designer that works in our office and sometimes uh, on her own. So we were selecting and taking all these pictures around our house, around the office, selecting them, classifying them, and making it work within uh, an architecture dialogue as, as if it was a piece of masonry cut out and mirrored and duplicated, uh, copied, pasted, different ways, composing an image out of it. And with Camilo Echeverri, the other architect, the other photographer, which happens to be an architect, we have a, a discussion about how do we engage into architecture as a cultural way of um, looking into things? Because in Colombia, uh, architecture doesn't occupy the territory of museums or galleries. So there is no discussion between architecture beyond the realm of making buildings. Uh, it's very, it happens, but it's very, um, it's very selective in the sense that once in a while, some architects, we get together, we have a conversation, we go to a dinner, but that's it. So in this way of operating, moving toward architects and especially photographers, it allows us to, to understand ways of looking into things. There is this um, beautiful text by Walter Benjamin about photography, which is called On Photography, I guess, in English, um, where he describes What's the role of the camera? What's the role of the eye? What's the role of the frame? What's the role of the image you are producing? What happens to the image that gets produced? So we try to, to deal and expand the conversation into that. How do, we, how do we look at things? And what do they give us back? So I'd like to thank Camilo for, on behalf of the school for the lecture and for the pleasure of having a conversation as well. Thank you, thank very, you very much. much. Thank you, Enrique. Thank you.